Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Zena Dixon to talk about It Chapter 2. This is a long one, but first, I'm going to let Zena introduce herself. Zena, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Deanna. Thank you so much for, for the invite. I'm really excited to talk about this movie because we have a weird relationship <laughs> being It. <laughs> Of course. So can you tell the listeners a little about yourself and what you do? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm I'm just a girl who loves horror. So I like to dabble in a lot of things. Um, I'm a part of the weekly Bloody Disgusting podcast where I give you some horror recommendations for you to check out. Uh, we try to keep it positive on the podcast. Just talking about all that horror love because, you know, the world we live in, it, is, it isn't always like butterflies and apples. So sometimes you just want to talk about that positivity when it comes to horror. I also have like a YouTube channel where I just like screaming at my camera about horror movies. It's just a good time. I feel that so much. I started a YouTube channel last year too, and I've done like King stuff, comic book stuff. I feel that. And you know, I try to keep it positive here too, but there are lots of bad Stephen King things. Yeah. And going chronologically, mm. <laughs> sometimes you hit a slump, but I feel like, you know, it's been a mixed bag in recent years. Mm -hmm. There's been some really fun stuff. There's been really good stuff that I've loved. And then there's been not so good stuff and some sure, bad stuff, yeah. <laughs> which is how it goes. And, you know, I think there's been a wider range of feelings with me in particular for the adaptations versus the books. I would say with like five exceptions, I thought all of the books were like fine to, I absolutely love them. And I only had a handful I didn't like. So, you know, that's a plus for me. But yeah, it chapter two, I want to ask you a question about the first movie before we dive into this one, because okay. You know, it felt like they did the first movie not really knowing if they were going to have a chapter two. So then they were like, oh, hey, we're going to do a second one. Now we have to cram all of the adult story into one. Did it feel like that to you? Do you think it would have been better if they had introduced the adults in the first movie, at least a little bit? Yeah, that's exactly how I how I felt. Um, there was a lot of, as the viewers, we received like a lot of information in the second one. Which was kind of hard at, at, during some scenes. Like some, I'm like, yeah, this is great. But then other times it's just like, whoa, you know, that two hours is really kicking in, you know. Um, but I agree with you. I think that it would have at least gave us something as the viewers to look forward to. Because at the same time, this is not putting down the first one or even putting down the second one. With the first one, it was on such a high, you know. I Majority of people who checked it out that I know of, they really enjoyed it and felt that it was just perfection. So you're up on this high, you know? So from there, you can, can you go higher? Could you just hit rock bottom? You know, I don't think that with the sequel, they hit rock bottom, but I agree where it kind of felt like they, they either they didn't know that there was going to be a second one or they really didn't plan because clearly, I don't, what I'm thinking about, like with the horror news and, you know, they'll post it on like Variety, Bloody Disgusting. I remember hearing about who they cast you know, as the adults when the sequel was about to come out, you know what I mean? Or when they were about to start filming, which was somewhere two years in between. Yeah. And obviously, we will get to the kids aging in that time period in a little bit. But the actual runtime on this is two hours and 49 minutes. And then I did watch some of the extras because I have the Blu-ray. So I was watching some of the stuff after it. And you feel it. You definitely you feel it quite a bit. And I think because they had to do so much catch up. You know, it is a very, very long book. It's one of King's longest books. It is very thick on the shelf. And you have you have so much story there that you can't really tell even with, let's call it roughly five hours of runtime between these two. And I absolutely adored the first movie. It grows on me like every time I watch it. I think I've watched it three times now, but I actually covered that with Prince Jackson and he was like, I've watched this many times. And I was like, you have me beat tenfold. So, <laughs> you know, that was sort of fun to talk about that one and just really get to know the kids. But then we have to rush getting to know them as adults because they each have their own lives and we get those intro scenes basically. And you're like, okay, 
this is this, this character's doing this, and this is what's going on, and this character literally married his mother because it's play, you know, it's the same actress. <laughs> and yeah. You have so much going on. But I do want to talk about the adult losers because I did really enjoy the casting. I think they did a nice job. And when I was watching the extras, the kids actually had input on who played the older versions of them, which I thought was really cool because, so cool. you know, they are literal teenagers at this point. And it's like the director is taking notes from them. And you really get to see how that works because they did get to spend some time together, the younger actors and the adult losers. So what did you think of the adult casting? Like you, I thought it was like, honestly, perfection. Like that is just like an all star cast, well put together. And at first, it's kind of like, because obviously, it's been 27 years, um, and they're adults now. So there's certain things where it's just like, okay, are they kind of the same? Are they not? You know, at first, when you first see them, it's just like, mm, that little shine isn't quite there, which is understandable. You know, it's been 27 years. And again, they're adults. So but I just feel like they all did a great job portraying, like the characters. One of the not necessarily complaints, but more so criticisms that I saw of the adult losers casting is that they didn't have chemistry quite as much as really? the kids did. And hmm. I didn't really feel that. I mean, I guess a little less chemistry than the kids, just because the kids are kids and it's like kind of easier to mm -hmm. immediately get along when you're that age. So I felt like it was maybe a little more natural in the first movie than it was in the second. Because you definitely get those awkward, oh, I'm, I'm remembering you, uh, you know, moments with the adult losers. Yeah, which I just took it as, you know, a lot about their childhood because of what happened, because of it, they don't remember. So for when they did connect, especially when they're at that restaurant, you know, and they all kind of had that little mini reunion, it was kind of nice, you know, like you could see them playing off of each other. I mean, I, I personally didn't get that vibe. Of course, when they're kids, like because like you said, kids are kids and it's easier for them. But then think about it. Say if you haven't seen someone in like 27 years after something super traumatic, horrific, evil clown eating children. I don't know. I think I think that it may take some time. I'm in agreement with you there. And that wasn't, you know, my criticism or complaint of the movie. It's just kind of something I saw around on Letterboxd with people I follow and whatnot. But I think they did a great job on both ends of the casting spectrum there. Bill Skarsgård just completely brought it again yeah. in this. <laughs> he is just so creepy. Like, and, and I mean that in the best way. Yeah. And when I was watching the extras, there was a section on him talking about portraying Pennywise and he just was like so normal sitting there talking about playing this like killer child eating clown and <laughs> one of the scenes I wanted to talk about first is sort of what we open with because you know Bill Hader, Jessica Chastain, all of the adult losers like we said great we didn't name them all by name but that's fine. There's there's a lot of people in this movie, okay? <laughs> so many. <laughs> and I think, you know, story-wise, this did start off in a weird spot because it started with the Adrian scene, which immediately just, you know, hits you with the homophobia right from the start. And it's not a pleasant start to the movie at all by any means, but it also felt like it never really led to anything other than a way to tell us Pennywise was back. So how did you feel about that? I haven't read the book and I'll tell you why. I I, I, I don't think I will because some of the things that I've heard um, that's a part that, that happens in the book kind of turned me off. You know, uh, there's a couple of things, but um, I just took that as uh, they wanted to include that because there's a lot of references in the book so I just assume that that's what they were trying to do. But say if you didn't know that, it's just kind of like, um, what does that have to do with anything? Or who are these people type of thing? Because I always thought that it went after children, you know? So, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but it was just like, that was just something that, that I thought. But I love the scene because I thought that it was unexpected and it was gruesome and it was it's traumatic. I mean, it's, that's not a favorite part of mine. Like even when I rewatched it, it was just kind of like, oh, you know, it was it wasn't something I can fully 
just stand to watch, but it kind of like set the tone because I like the fact that with this one, compared to the first one, even though, I, okay, I'm kind of jumping ahead. It's okay. <laughs> I really love seeing, thank you. <laughs> I really love seeing it. I love seeing like the clown, you know? And the first one, we really didn't see it too much, you know? It was always in the shadows lurking. And this one, there's times where we do see it and it's in broad daylight. But for some reason, even though we see him more, I want more. So it was just kind of like, even with that opening, the fact that we saw him right away, I can't really like complain because it's just like, say if I didn't know that kind of reference from the book, I would just be happy just to see him. You know what I mean? That makes sense. And for me, I felt like it was a very bold choice because that's something that could immediately turn people off of the movie because of how harsh it is. And if you watch the first one, you know Pennywise is not going to be nice, you know, but the fact that it's just bullies in town who really do this terrible thing and small town Maine. I mean, given the time period and everything too, that we're kind of switching up from the book it felt maybe a little out of date, admittedly, for, you know, present day, because what they did with the movie was instead of the kids being in the 50s, I believe they were in the 80s or 90s or something like that. And then so that would bring our adult time period to the present day when the second movie was coming out, basically. And it really just felt like that was definitely a bold move to start with that because yeah it is part of the book and I totally understand not wanting to read the book it's still a favorite of mine despite its flaws as I've been doing this podcast I've been trying to think about all of these works in the context of the time period they came out in which is hard to do because there are so many things in not only King novels but the short stories and adaptations and everything that do not age super well for, you know, the time period I've been doing this. This started in 2018. And so I'm kind of going on year three here and wrapping up. And it is, you know, sometimes hard to do that. And I feel like with this scene, I understand why people wouldn't like it. And it's, you know, a pretty big scene to start out with, too. And then we see Pennywise is back. And then you have Mike's sort of voiceover that leads us into, okay, the story is really going to get going here. And Mike starts calling everyone and he's like, hey, it's Mike. And it's like, Mike, you know, they're forgetting because they haven't contacted you in 27 mm -hmm. years or whatever right? it's been. <laughs> Mike who? <laughs> yeah. You know, give some more context, Mike. But they definitely did some things that I understand are going to be tough. There's a lot of CGI that did not age well already. I'm like, this was two years ago? Are we sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, one that I, I noticed that I felt like was kind of like distracting with the character Richie when he was a kid. And it was just kind of like, wait, what? Because I remember I went to go see it in, in theaters. And so, you know, you're seeing it on the big screen. And I remember back then, I thought he looked like weird. And I was just like, whatever. And so then I watched it again at home. I'm just like, whoa, which I guess I get it because, <laughs> you know, uh, the character, he probably, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the kid's name. Finn Wolfhard. Thank you. Yes, Finn. I, I heard that he had like a, a growth spurt. So <laughs> he's like almost six feet tall now. <laughs> Yeah, and I get it, but it was just like something with his like face, you know, where it was just it looked a little off, you know, and I get it, I understand why, yeah. but I mean, I think I'm understanding. So, but say if you're someone who noticed that kind of stuff, it could be distracting. Yeah. I noticed it a little with Ben, I think too. It was like they were trying to make his cheeks a little chubbier or something at times. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really, you know, like noticing those things. And even some of the Pennywise CGI, like when Pennywise becomes the big spider and everything, you're like, oh, okay, that's, you know, that's a little jarring. But I think for the most part, because this movie was so much longer than the first one, too. They probably had roughly the same budget, I would guess. I didn't, you know, look up budget numbers. But when you're adding another 30 minutes to a movie with roughly the same budget, I imagine that makes CGI a little more difficult. But I think I was willing to give a lot of things in this movie a pass because I loved the first one so much. And 
you know, this whole thing is really about friendship and, you know, being able to overcome these traumatic events. And you have Pennywise acting as this, you know, foreign evil, if you will. And I've said before that I'm not a huge fan of King's like traditionally alien stories, but I think here it works because Pennywise never feels like an alien. He definitely just feels like this sort of evil entity, not, you know, like Tommy Knocker's aliens. Right, right. And, and you know, I, I agree with you um, for, for two things. So like with the first one where it's just like, I gave this movie like a lot of passes because I really enjoyed the first one. But at the same time, not that you're saying this, but it was just like at the same time, there's just something that's so charming about it. Yes. You know, that you just you just accept it and, and, and you just enjoy it because you already have like a connection with the characters. And even though there's like a lot of blood and I mean, I, I love that there's a lot of blood and <laughs> <laughs> disturbing content, but it's, it's a, it's a good time, you know? So it's also kind of not trying to sound cheesy, a beautiful story, a little heartbreaking, you know, but it's uh like you said, it is about friendship, you know? And, and I think that that's, that's, beautiful and, and everything. The other thing is too, you know, I was trying to think about it and I want your opinion on this as well. I was trying to think about like, okay, how could they have not fixed that, but where it's just like, it seemed like kind of like what, what you said earlier about, okay, did they know that there was going to be a sequel, you know? So, and, and I know I love, I love seeing it on the big screen, but I'm also kind of curious if, if it was just like released as a miniseries you know um even though I know like two and a half hours like that's kind of like normal now like there's so many movies that's that length but I'm just wondering like do you think that that could have helped so say if with the first one they actually had it you know um and theaters and then because it's so lengthy you know and because which is understandable you told me how thick the book is <laughs> and I've seen those books and there's just so much information you know, not that we want everything, but and sometimes it just kind of felt a little bit rushed with the second one, you know? So, um, but yeah, I'm just I'm curious about your thoughts with that. Yeah, you know, talking about what is the best medium for King's books is something I love doing because there have been certain things like Under the Dome, which was three seasons of TV and went so far off from the book. I don't even know what was going on by season three. I was like, this isn't the book. <laughs> and, you know, I think because those two are kind of comparable in size, you know, you could hurt someone with my Under the Dome hardcover that I have because it's so big. And with it, I've always thought that like an eight episode limited series or something would sort of allow for the perfect amount of time for that story because you can still cut the weird things that King wrote <laughs> into the book. Right, right. For sure. But it would allow you more time with, especially the adult characters in this instance, because we do still get a lot of flashback scenes to them as kids where it's either replaying the same scene from the first movie or, you know, adding something a little different, which I wasn't a huge fan that they replayed the entire, like, we're gonna, you know, cut our hands open thing. And I was like, we don't, you just ended with that. We don't really need that. I know it's been two years in between movies, but it did feel like they did things that they could have either cut out and shaved off some time or replaced with, you know, other things we hadn't already seen. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. See, I knew you would know. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, I think eight episode limited series would be good in the right hands. Because as right. I was telling you before we hit record here, I just finished watching the new Stan series, which was nine episodes. And I was like, I don't know what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. That one just for me, it jumped around a lot. You know, it was like all over the place. It was like, oh, she's very pregnant now. Oh, wait, she's not pregnant now. Okay, all right, we're going all over the place. So I think, you know, because the book goes back and forth, we see adult moments and we see kid moments, but it says so. Like it tells you we are in this time period. I think if you could have a mini series where you have episode one, kids, episode two, adults, episode three, kids, episode four, adults, kind of formatted a little more like the book that might work a little better or even half episodes, you know, right? cut it in half. That's, I think that that would have like 
that would have been great. And I understand, like, the big screen, going to theaters, that's that's awesome, you know? But That's where the money is. Was. I don't know. I think that that series <laughs> could have been, especially, like, now, you know? Um, back then, even though it wasn't that long ago, I'm saying it like it's a long time ago, <laughs> but, you know, it was it was different, you know, a couple of years ago, but now it's more understandable, so. Yeah, the first movie made bank, so I don't blame them at all. And it did feel like they were like, oh, we got to do the adult story now because that one did so well. And it would have flowed so much better if they could have just, you know, kept the kids filming and you wouldn't have had that weird CGI stuff. And, you know, I'm kind of racking my brain here. I'm like, so much happened in this movie. I don't even know where to go next with the discussion. And I think so much. Yeah. The best place to start is the adult's getting back to Derry and starting to remember things. And then they do the thing you do not do in horror movies, which they definitely made fun of in this. They split up. <laughs> and it was just like, they, it's like, come on, guys, you just said it. Like, not to split up. But, you know, I, I'm ready to see it. I'm ready to see some some disturbing craziness. So let's let's go. Yeah. And, you know, I know that the adult actors try to take on some of the same mannerisms as the kids do. This Blu-ray has a ton of great extras. I didn't even watch all of them. I was just watching like the 10 minute ones. And then there was like an hour of stuff I still didn't even watch. How awesome. Yeah. So there's like making of stuff. They talked to Stephen King. They talked to Bill Skarsgård, like I said, the kids, the adults. And, you know, it seemed like everyone had a really good time making this and I feel like you could tell and that's why I'm so willing to give this a lot of passes you know it's not a perfect adaptation it's not as good as the first one it's not even close to the worst thing I've seen so right know. right yeah and you know I do remember too like when it first came out um it took me a little bit like I don't think I went to go check it out the first week um but I remember hearing about it and there were like a lot of people saying that they were disappointed you know, um, and I'm just like, oh, no, it's just like because I was thinking, like, how can you guys go wrong? Like, you know, because you were you ended on such a high, you know, and I know a lot of things come into like to factor in. But then when I checked it out, I'm just like, this is like you said, not the worst thing. I was entertained. It was a very lengthy movie. I knew, but you knew that before going in, you know, um, so but, you know, people are different and prefer different things, I guess, too. Um, I think for me, why I think that it's like that. For people, I think that when it comes to like perspectives, that's a huge, that makes like a huge like difference because with the first one, it was from like kids per perspective. So of course there's going to be things that's just like terrifying because there are a couple of scenes that I can just think of from the first one that kind of creeped me out from, you know, seeing it from their perspective. But then with this one, when there was like some creepy stuff happening, you know, it wasn't that scary for me, you know, from the adult perspective. So I think that that had like a, a lot to do with it as well. Absolutely. And there's a character we have not mentioned yet who comes back from the first movie as well. And that is Henry Bowers. What a wild man. Henry. Yeah. What did you think of his involvement in the story in this way because you know obviously dead people can't drive cars but they can in Stephen King movies and he makes his great escape and you know I think he just plays it so well because you know it flashes back to what he had been through at his house with his dad and everything and his dad not great none of these kids really had great parents you know I think like Stan's parents in the first movie were the ones we didn't even see at all or saw the least of. And Bill's parents were understandably going through all of this grief. So, you know, but every other parental situation we saw was like, no, no, we don't want that. <laughs> and, you know, we do not. <laughs> same with Henry. And he really, I would say, suffers the most, actually, out of everyone from the first movie. And it does not end well for him. It does not. You know, at first I kind of felt bad for him when they first showed him because now he's older, obviously, and he still has a mullet. And for some reason, um, well, he's because he was arrested. We could do spoilers, right? Spoilers. Yes. yes. Okay. Spoiler alert. I'm so, so bad at those. I need to do those because <laughs> these are way more recent things. Thank you. <laughs> so, OK, well, Henry, he was actually arrested for uh, killing his father and then he was um, released. Uh, well, 
he wasn't released, but he was freed from the hospital, you know? And then he decides to attack, like, the Losers Club. So, you know, Bill, Ben, Beverly, like... And, okay, what I agree with you because I feel like at this point, they were all able to leave the town. They were all able to leave it behind and build, build a life like for themselves. But he did not. Except for Mike. Except for Mike. Mike decided to stay, I think. You know, he wanted to stay and be the person to kind of be the keeper, keep a keep a lookout on people. And and being a librarian, much better fate than Henry, you know. I, as you can see, I would love to be a librarian. That wouldn't bother me. <laughs> I mean, a librarian seems like they can still live it up, though, you know. But <laughs> Henry, though, um, no, you know, and you just felt bad for him at first. But then it's just kind of like that changes very quickly because, okay, is it his fault that he is... I don't know what to say this, but he's pretty much being recruited uh, by uh, this dead kid with no teeth. And then also with it, you know what I mean? Is it his fault? And I mean, I think it's because evil is attracted to evil and he was like an evil kid. So now he's an evil, an, uh, like evil Dell, you know? So, but I agree with you. I think that he definitely had it worse because he stayed in that town and for 27 years. I don't know. That, that's it's it's sad when you when you think about it because he didn't really experience anything. Yeah, especially because he was a teenager when everything happened. And you know, I did want to talk about how the rest of the losers had much greater success in life. You could say because we do see what they're all up to at the beginning, and you know, some of them have these amazing lives. You can tell Bill is like the struggling writer and they make fun of endings a lot, which is perfect for a Stephen <laughs> King adaptation. And we get the Stephen King cameo, of course, too, where he yes, says that. Yes, I love sucks, that. Just, just, <laughs> I love how, you know, open he is to doing stuff like that and, you know, making jokes about his own work, essentially. And Stan is the only one who does not come back because... We know how afraid Stan was as a kid, and obviously they all were, but there's just something about Stan that you're like, he's definitely going to be the one who might not <laughs> go back. And yeah, we don't really know exactly why until the very end. And I kind of love that they held that until the end, mm -hmm. because then we're kind Same. of just thinking about Stan, not necessarily the whole time, but you know, it's like we notice more that he's missing because we don't really know why he decided to take his own life. And it was one of those things where it was definitely, you know, another tough scene to watch for sure. This movie uh, definitely needs to be filled with like trigger warnings at the beginning mm -hmm. because seriously, it is definitely rough with quite a few of the scenes. But what did you think of Stan being the one to not return and the way that, you know, they showed us that? It broke my heart, you know, um, just because it seemed like he, even when he answered the phone call and you could hear that he was nervous, you know, you could hear it in his voice and he's trying to make small talk, but he knows why he's being called, you know, and he just, he could not handle it at all you know but it's something that they all promised and it's it's not like okay say if they just didn't call him you know what I mean mm -hmm. I, they would have something would have happened there would have been a way to like you know what I mean to, to, to bring him back so I guess maybe the only way he felt that he couldn't is through death you know and so that's what I was thinking in the beginning and so it's just really sad you know that he just he could not do it, you know, um, that his anxiety was that bad. And then receiving the note at the end or the letter at the end, you know, it's kind of like, again, we're, we're wrapping up the story. So there's like a lot of things that I found that I found really sad about this movie. Mm -hmm. Stan's letter being one of them, you know, and then also just because it, it's the end of it. And it's just like, I want more, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> it, I just found it like just honestly heartbreaking because you know, they were a team. Yeah, question for you, because I feel like I've been, you know, slowly losing my mind somewhat during this whole okay. process here. But for whatever reason, Stephen King writes about these terrible things happening in these small towns, and yet I still want to live in one. Do, <laughs> does anyone else feel this way? Is it just me? But they seem like fun little places to live, aside from all the evil things that happen. 
Yeah. Okay. I don't know about living, but I would visit. But I'm pretty okay. sure something would probably happen. And I, I mean like a long, I'm going to stay here for the summer. You know what I mean? So, but it was just like, I don't know though. I, I don't know if I would personally want to see it in person. You know, like I'm, I'm about that horror life on screen, <laughs> but real life horror happening in my life. Like I, I my legs will be shaking like jello. So <laughs> it just seems like those kind of towns are very much my vibe. And you see the theater <laughs> with the marquee and it's like Nightmare on Elm Street 5. And I'm like, that's where I want to live at that theater. Oh, that yeah. is where I would like to live. <laughs> I get it. So, you know, maybe my love of horror has gone a little too far here, but that's okay. (laughs) And, you know, I mentioned earlier how they do the one thing you don't do in horror movies, and that's split up, which they have a reason for doing it. They each need to go find their token, so to speak. And for Richie, it's quite literally a token, but (laughs) that's okay. And, you know, that kind of brings about some more lighthearted moments where Eddie's like, that's not going to burn. It's metal like what are you doing (laughs) yeah like the rock's not gonna burn either (laughs) i love their relationship richie and eddie's relationship is just so cool such a great relationship yeah and you know they each go through these things individually and it's no different than the first movie really they all saw pennywise individually so you know that's kind of tracking with what we saw in the first movie and you know all the balloons and pennywise up on paul bunyan there great scene you know i think that was really well done and you know bill Hader really just nailed like richie as a character you know i think him and finn sort of were very much on the same page with his mannerisms and everything like that and you know bill's stutter comes back Mm -hmm. which i enjoyed because you know he had kind of worked his way out of that yeah it's one of those things where they really do revert back to being kids almost in a sense. And once they have everything and then they're all together, you're like, okay, let's go. We're going to kill this clown again. <laughs> and, you know, it just really gets to that point in the movie where you're like, okay, here we go. We're all in, all of us, viewers and Losers Club. And I really just love that feeling that you get when that happens and you're like, okay. And then, you know, they're bringing up the ritual of Chud. And you're like, yes, thank you. We we needed this. This is what we needed. And, you know, it's a horror movie. It's a horror story. Nothing goes as planned. But they're together. And that is, like, truly what the core of this story is about. It's not even about Pennywise, really. Right. So how does that all work for you? Were you like anticipating that this time when you watched it? Were you like, okay, I just kind of want them to all be together again? Like, is that a slow point in the movie for you maybe? Or, you know, how do you feel about them splitting up and then, you know, because it does take a while. Right. Because we have to see each of them. I agree. I thought that kind of like the slower part was when they split up, which is understandable and not saying it wasn't entertaining. I was entertained as, as a viewer, duh, you know, watching it. But I was really looking forward to the part where it's just like, okay, they need to come together because kind of like what you said, it's not about it. It's about, or Pennywise. I I just like calling him it. But yeah, it's it's not about Pennywise, but it is about, you know, the kids, these adults, these friends, you know, it's about friendship. And so, and sticking together and being a team. So the fact that I feel like once they came together though, it's just like, how are they going to like wrap this up? Because when I looked at, you know, how long we had or how long, how much longer I had of the movie. It was probably like 50 minutes more. I'm like, okay, there's no way they'll be taking him on for 50 minutes, you know? Yeah. So um, I just, you know, was keeping a look at, at that. And it's weird because it's not that I forgot, but I guess because now since I was able to watch it at home, you know, I can like look at the time, um, keep an eye on the time. So I don't know. I think that part where they all came together to go after him, like they did when they were kids, that to me was a really epic part. You know, that's that's the part that's super exciting. And as I said to you earlier, I knew that with it being over two hours, that there were going to be some slow parts, you know, some. Um, not saying it's not entertaining, but I just recommend having patience when you are checking it out. And the information that you're receiving, it's necessary. You know, like even when I think about Beverly, and she went back to her her apartment where, you know, her and her dad lived. 
and that older woman just being creepy. <laughs> Yeah, the Pennywise you know? picture on the wall, and you even have that moment where you see that version of Pennywise, and you know, he's like wiping the makeup off his face, and you know, it all serves this purpose in the end, and they do have to do a lot of explaining because of how the movies came out. You know, we have to get that whole explanation of what the ritual of Chud is, and they leave it to Mike to do that, and you know... I talked about this with Prince, and we were kind of on the same page with Mike feeling underused in the first movie, especially because it kind of starts with him and we get a look at his life and, you know, he's being bullied and then he doesn't really have a whole lot to do because they give all the uh, they give all the history of dairy stuff to Ben for some reason in the first movie. But then they flip that in this because Mike is the librarian. He stayed behind. So he's the one with all of the information this time. And even though I'm not 100% sold on their use of Mike in this, I think it was much better than it was in the first movie. What do you think about that? I, I agree with you and Prince because, you know, I remember seeing his character and he he had a different, like all the other kids, he had a, a different point of view. And I felt like his point of view, you know, I really wanted to know more about him because he, he was being bullied, you know, because of the color of his skin. And then he also found like these great kids, you know, and he's new in town, you know. So the fact that he was new in town, right? I don't think he was necessarily new in town. He just lived on the outside of town. So he was like the outsider and Ben was new in town. Okay, got it. See, okay, that's a good point. Yeah. So I don't know. I just kind of felt that I just wanted to know more about him. But at the same time, kind of what we spoke about, I like that Mike did stay, you know, um, just because we were able to learn more about him and like see him take it on. But then at the same time, it's it's kind of sad that he stayed there because he didn't quite move on. He didn't have a wife or kids or, you know, not saying that everyone else had kids or anything, but, you know, he, he didn't. Everybody else had like careers, you know, like you were talking about earlier and they were pretty proud of it. And not saying he's not proud to be a librarian, but it's just like you stayed in the town. Yeah. Like a watchdog. I, I don't know. You know, there are plenty of places you can be a librarian. It didn't have to be dairy. You know, that's a perfectly fine profession by all means. And, right. you know, maybe not as sought after now as it was previously. But I think, you know, for Mike, he kept having to make sacrifices that no one else had to make. Mm. Yeah, he did. Like, even when he did that, uh, the, the ritual of Chud and the drugs and it's just like what like you know so and I, I get it you know but I don't okay yeah so I, I was going down a rabbit hole <laughs> no 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 it's just one of those things where you know there have been so many tropes in horror movies which I'm sure you're equally as aware of but it's like oh yes they always kill off the black character first mm -hmm. and you know it's like they obviously don't do that here which is good yeah. But at yeah. the same time, they do other things to Mike and you're like, this wasn't great, but okay. <laughs> and it was just kind of like, I guess what's weird is even though Stan, Stanley wasn't really in it, kind of like what you were saying earlier, we, as the viewers, we still thought about him often, you know, like we were still concerned about him and not saying that I wasn't too much concerned about Mike. It was cool seeing him at the forefront and trying to get people to you know, um, like, yeah, this is this is what we must do. But it also seemed like Bill was more of the leader, if that makes sense. You know, um, and I don't I don't really know what Mike's role was, like researcher, historian, you know, but then it's like you guys are still kind of listening to Bill. Yeah, especially when they go to leave the restaurant and Bev makes the call and finds out that Stan has passed and that's why he's not there they all are just like okay bye you know they didn't even want to hear Mike out it's like they went all the way to Maine for dinner it's like come on <laughs> you can't be serious you didn't come all the way here for dinner and to leave and Mike really has to rely on Bill to get everyone back on board and you know you can tell that Ben is like uh, we got to do the right thing, but he's not really the leader of the group. And he's the one who 
sort of had the most dramatic change from, you know, kid version to adult version. And he held on to his yearbook page all those years, even though they had forgotten a lot of their childhood. We see that in his wallet before he goes back to Maine. And, you know, you still have Bev not knowing who wrote the poem for her 27 years later. And, you know, that kind of all finally comes together because Mike brought them back together. And then they all get to live their lives the way they've actually wanted to, you know, at the end, Bev and Ben end up together, you know, Bill isn't having writer's block. And Mike is finally like, I'm gonna leave. And unfortunately, Eddie does not make it out, of course. And you see Richie going back. And this is something else I wanted to ask you about, too. But you see Richie recarving the letters into the tree. And Prince and I talked about this, too. And we were just like, we never really picked up on like anything other than a friendship between those two. Did you pick up on anything? Was that kind of forced for you? No, I mean, I just thought it was just a friendship. I mean, maybe I'm a jerk, but I enjoy making fun of my friends. So you know what I mean? You have that kind of relationship where you guys can go back and forth. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was their like their personality. But I guess looking back at it, it's just like, okay, well, maybe that's why they would pick on each other, you know, but I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Eddie went on to get married to literally his mom because played by the same actress, you know, <laughs> which is easy to not catch because we see like a quick glimpse of her at the beginning. And I was like, oh, that's the that's the one who played his mom. <laughs> you know, it's just a funny thing there. And, you know, Richie is single. He's a comedian. And, you know, they do a flashback when Richie is looking for the token, the literal token. He's back in the arcade. And, you know, it goes back to people calling him homophobic slurs, which we didn't see really in the first movie. So it just felt a little off. And I know that was sort of not necessarily a point of contention, but another criticism that I commonly saw with this movie. So I was curious if it kind of felt the same for you. And it sounds like it did. <laughs> it did. It did. And I, I don't know, it just seemed a little bit rush like it was it was a sad ending you know it was really sad because obviously he didn't really get to tell him they didn't get to tell each other I mean even though they knew but it was just kind of like as the the viewers we didn't know yeah. until that actual moment you know before Eddie's death so at least for me I mean I, I even re-watching it it's just kind of like I still didn't pick up on it yeah. I was like looking for it too. And I was like, okay, they put that arcade scene in, but he wasn't with Eddie. He was with some, like, he was with like Henry's cousin or something playing a game. And, you know, the kid thought he was being weird. And I was like, he just wants to keep playing the game. Like, that's, what? yeah, that, I just, what? Yeah. I was <laughs> like, you're at an arcade. I don't. Children yeah, I was strange. confused. <laughs> I was like, I'm not picking up on any of this with same. Richie yeah. and Eddie. So, yeah, I, I'm glad we're on the same page there. But, man, like I said, so much happens in this movie. And there's that whole scene with the little girl with the birthmark that mm -hmm. I tend to forget about because I'm like, why was that really there? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But Bill Skarsgård being creepy, I'll take it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty creepy scene. You know, he was drooling and oh, he drools a lot, yeah. but he was drooling. And then she was just smiling, just like trying to, oh, my cheek, you know, and it's just like she just got her head bitten off. Like, you know, oh, my, it was just shocking, you know? Yeah. And I think they put in a lot of scenes, not a lot, but they put in scenes like that to just emphasize how terrible Pennywise is, because when Eddie dies, it's not the most brutal death that we see in the movie by any means, you know, because at that point, Pennywise is in spider mode and just sort of stabs Eddie and that's it. It's not like his head was getting bitten off as a child, you know? Right, like, right. I think the child deaths are way more brutal and you have the whole funhouse thing with the kid who runs into Bill and Bill tells him to get away from the sewer and then, you know, there's that whole thing too and while they do serve a purpose, I think that one in particular with Bill and the kid was a little too long. I was like, they really spent a lot of time on this kid we just met who lived lives in Bill's old house, you know? So mm -hmm. I think there were definitely things they could have cut down on because this 
you do feel the length of this movie. Yeah. And I, I thought that little kid was so cute. You know, we <laughs> we saw him a couple of times and it, it made me sad. He too got his whole head, well, his whole body was just chopped on and blood splattered and it's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, they went all out with the kills in this one. You know, not to say they didn't in the first one, but they really wanted to use that CGI in this one yeah. <laughs> for sure. So, Zena, are there any scenes in particular that you want to talk about before we sort of talk a little more about that big final battle? Because like we've been saying, lots happens. Easy to miss some things here. Well, one scene that does come to mind with Henry, and we kind of talk about with Henry, but basically when he stabs Eddie in the face. That was a shocking scene. And then it's just like, at first, I was just thinking, okay, I, I not that I forgot about Henry, but it was just more like, whoa, is this real? Because it was just like right in the face, you know? It was just shocking. Like, he was just waiting. And then when he jumped out the window and he's just still Henry, kid Henry, like, terrorizing them. I don't know. It was just like a fun scene, even though it was like we were coming back from, because I was telling you, there were certain scenes that I thought were pretty slow. But this one, that kind of like, I'm trying to say it with my hands, but no one can see me, but you can, but amped it up, yeah. you know? Got the juices me, flowing. So. Thank you. Got the juices flowing. So yeah, it was just like a, it was a good scene. Shocking. Yeah. And they sort of plan those moments almost at the perfect times, because like you said, they kind of come when things are getting slow and you're like, yeah, okay, let's, let's pick it up a little. And they're like, okay, we will. Mm-hmm. We're going to stab someone. Don't worry. <laughs> and I think, you know, one thing I want to know is who on earth was working at that inn? Because it was no one. <laughs> no one. It's like they were just there alone and all this creepy, creepy skateboards and stuff sliding down the stairs. Yeah, there was like crazy stuff happening. No questions asked. Like they clearly all checked in at some point And I was like, where'd this person <laughs> go? <laughs> what are we doing here? They only check in and check out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're there for an hour window and then, no, thank you. I know what happens here. <laughs> I don't blame them. You really can't. You can't blame anyone in Derry for anything. So, <laughs> but yeah, I really just like the scene where Bill got the bike back too. Yeah. And, you know, he was racing down the street on the bike and he like the handlebars flipped down <laughs> on him and it, it was like all falling apart and he finally got it going and then... You know, he loses his stutter for that, you know, brief period of time when he's yelling at the top of his lungs, riding silver yeah. down the street. And like I said earlier, you could tell they had fun making this movie. Yeah, for sure. And it's much better when you can tell that because, like, I've watched a lot of bad, bad Stephen mm -hmm. King adaptations, but then there's, like, the bad, fun adaptations, and then there's some that right. are good, not great like this one. And they're still fun. Like, you know, for me, a return to Salem's Lot was not fun at all. I don't know what happened with that or why we needed it. Nobody asked for it. Maximum Overdrive, terrible but a blast. <laughs> so much fun, though. <laughs> yeah. A lot of fun. <laughs> and this, you know, it's a perfectly fine movie and you can tell people we're having fun. So mm -hmm. I have fun. And I think that is really important for scenes like that to work because it could have yeah. just felt like ah they're just recreating scenes from when they were kids and it's you know who cares and I think all of those scenes that they kind of did recreate worked because the characters were feeling it just as much as we were I agree that's that's again like with the charm like you know I think that you you hit it perfectly they just all seem like they were having fun so as the viewer, you're going to want to watch it. And I don't mind, even though this movie's long, I don't mind rewatching it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it on a rewatch because like you, I hadn't seen this since theaters. You know, I had rewatched the first one before the second one came out and then I rewatched it again for the podcast. So I had seen that one three times now and this one was only my second watch. So I was like... Oh, am I gonna am I gonna feel this three hours too much? And you know, yes, I felt it, but I didn't mind that I spent the time doing it. And I think that's important. And it goes to show just how well King can write certain characters because the Losers Club, you just want to spend time with them. Yeah, you do. And I think the way they cast both movies really helped with that because you're like, yes, I like these people. I would like to be friends with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Same. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I did like this just as much. I think in theaters, I saw it in Dolby, which was like, whoo, big, big rumbles in, in Ooh, that. Okay. You know? nice. So I didn't get that at home, but that's okay, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and I think the big scene at the end was kind of where they put a lot of that CGI budget and, you know, they had the big spider and they had deflated Pennywise, which looked nasty. And, you know, they actually had a kid in that. That wasn't necessarily CGI when, you know, the heads all deflated. They mm-hmm. got a kid and put a kid in the little Pennywise How suit. How cool! Whoa! And then at times they had Bill just popping his head up. And then mm. it was just his head, like, stapled to the, the stuff there. Or yeah. Not, not his head stapled to it. You know what I mean. The, the mm-hmm. Pennywise head stapled to it. But it was just, you know, one of those things where obviously when he's shrinking, it's CGI. But when, you know, he's down to the smaller size, you know, that's more practical effects. So, you know, I think... I love practical effects. I think they just hold up so much better. Same, so, same. you know, there were definitely moments where you were like, okay, this CGI isn't holding up so well with the giant spider crawling all around these caves. Because let's be real, if a giant spider was crawling around those sewers, caves, whatever, I feel like it all would have collapsed like sooner yeah. than it did. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking that as well, you know, but <laughs> at this point, it was just like, I really love like this ending, you know, when it's coming down. It's sad, you know, because it's ending and then, you know, Eddie and everything. But um, just again, with them all being together, once again, this is like the finale. This is it, you know, and they have to obviously because I mean, if I saw like a giant spider, though, like my legs would give out and, you know, so, but the fact that even though it's like, this is something that terrorized them when they were children, and now it's kind of like they have to come back to destroy it because even with that little kid on the skateboard and, and the little girl at that game, you know, under the bleachers, just seeing how it's g- coming after like a new generation of kids, you know, so they have to stop it. And there's a lot of things that's coming up. Like I know, like with Bill, like he finally just admit that he felt guilty, you know, about his brother, Georgie, he just didn't want to play with him that day, you know, but it's just kind of like, but that's not your fault. <laughs> you know, it's not your fault that it that it happened. And even though as we could tell him that, and I know he's not real, but you know, <laughs> we could tell him that, you know, as a viewer from the outside, but you know, when it actually happens. And so just the fact that we're getting like, I love, a, I love when movies give us actual conclusions, you yeah. know what I mean? Where they're, they're closing chapters, they're closing doors and it's... Again, it's sad with what happens with Eddie, you know, but at the same time, it, it's, a, it's a sacrifice. It's something that, that happened. And I felt like it kind of just hit even harder, you know, for yeah. us all, because now it's something that they do have to live with. But th- they're living with it with not trying to sound cheesy, but with, with good strength. So it was just like a really great, it's a horror. Yeah. You know, of course, you're going to get the blood. You're going to get the creatures. You're going to get like the deflated head, you know. <laughs> Pennywise yeah. up against a rock, um, the squishing of his heart. But it's just, again, it, it's just a beautiful ending. What I really enjoy about sort of that final boss battle, if you will, is the fact that even if you've read the book, the way that they have that whole thing play out where Bill gets trapped underwater and, you know, Bev and Ben are like in blood and dirt and, you know, all of this stuff going on. You never really know, at least the first time you watch it, that it's only going to be one of them that dies. You know, it really feels like yeah. any of them could die at any moment. And you have the deadlights moment where Richie's up in the air and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, my oh God, no, because, <laughs> you know, it was Bev in the first movie. And then mm-hmm. to not recreate that the same way with Bev and give her her sort of carry moment instead yeah. in the bathroom there, you're just like, oh, boy, you, you're all going through <laughs> a lot right now. And you never really know. You're just like, OK, you think Eddie's going to be triumphant in this moment. And he turns mm-hmm. his back on Pennywise, which another thing you don't do in horror movies. You don't do that. No. <laughs> Someone yeah. should have told Eddie the rules. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think he could have made it. Yeah. And, you know, in the book, you know, it, it's pretty true to the book where one of them doesn't make it out. And I think, you know, I like that they still made you feel like, 
this could end for all of them, you know, and that's a different kind of closure in a sense. But, you know, we need the losers to to get a win here. So they do. And it's not a feel good win because they lost Mm -hmm. one of their friends. And, you know, King doesn't necessarily do happy endings, but Mm -hmm. he doesn't do like end of the world situations either, really. He does like these triumphant endings that give you hope. And I think this movie accomplished that really well. I I agree. That's well said. Yeah. So anything else before we talk about ratings real quick here? Okay. This is going to sound weird. We already did talk about Mike, right? And where do you think he went? What do you think that he decided to go or what do you, what do you think he wants to do? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I know it's like, who cares? But I don't, <laughs> I care because I was just thinking about that. No, no, no. Let's uh, live out Mike's story here. Okay. And, you know, I don't remember if he said specifically where he was going. I think he said possibly something about going to Florida, which I like that idea because that's what King does. You know, he, yeah, he yeah. lives in Maine, goes to Florida, gets some sunshine. Not so much snow and evil. And yeah. Stuff. Well, Florida's a whole other thing. But <laughs> I, know. I live here. <laughs> Sorry. It's humid. It's okay. Humidity I is here. <laughs> a whole other thing on its own. I, I lived on the East Coast briefly for college, so I, I understand the humidity thing. Okay. <laughs> I want Mike on a beach somewhere, you know. Yeah. Reading a book that is not about the ritual of Chud. <laughs> <laughs> or dairy or anything like that. I I want Mike to have a good time. I imagine Mike on a beach meeting someone nice who also likes books. Yeah, that's see, that's beautiful. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just uh, missed out on him saying saying Florida, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I was just thinking that he probably just decided to I don't know go to a different town. I could be wrong. He could have said. I want to go somewhere warm or something like that. And my brain just went to Florida. Florida's warm. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, there's brutal winters up there and everything. So in, in Maine. So that makes like a lot of sense, you know, but I agree with you. I see him meeting someone nice, him settling down and the person likes books too, you know, and they just live happily ever after. We're going to write some King fan fiction for you all. <laughs> Better yet, we'll make it a YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> We could break down every single character, you know? Great series. That could be fun. <laughs> I'm down for that. Me talk about King? No, never. <laughs> do a whole podcast about it. But Xena, let's talk about ratings because, you know, my rating changed a tiny bit on rewatch. Okay. I ended up giving this a three out of five on rewatch. I gave it a three and a half out of five the first time I watched it. But because okay. some of that CGI just didn't <laughs> hold up as well, I was like, this is you know, pretty middle of the road. And I have probably given a lot of things threes out of five, but... Me too. (laughs) It's not bad. No, not at all. It means I liked it. It was not bad. Mm -hmm. It was not great. It was not a masterpiece. You know, I'm very stingy with giving out fives. Like the first it is like a four and a half out of five. I don't know why it just is. But, you know, I think this was a little bit of a step down, but... I still had a good time with it. Right? Okay. Um, I don't remember, like, how I felt. I was in the middle, like, uh, when I first watched it. I thought it was, you know, cool. But, you know, it wasn't, like, the worst thing. wasn't the best thing. But it's like, oh, it's cool. So re-watching it, though, um, I still kind of feel the same way. But I'm going to give it a three. I'm going to give it a three. Just because I feel very much similar to you. It's just, like, if you're someone who, say, if you never watched the movie at all, I, I think that you're still going to have a good time with it. You know, you'll still be entertained. But again, I just recommend, you know, during those slower parts, just to have patience. Like, I feel like the ending is a great payoff. Yeah, it it felt like you got to hang out with some friends for a few hours. Yeah, but then it's sad to see them go. Like, why do it you is. have to leave? <laughs> You know, and it's funny because that's kind of why this is one of my favorite King stories, because he spends so much time with the characters, both as kids and adults in the book, because the book's so dang long, you know, even though it has flaws and everything like that. It was just something that resonated with me so much because I watched the first movie before I read the book, and I probably was reading the book a little bit 
before the second movie came out, I want to say, or right around the time this movie came out. And then, you know, I've seen the 1990 miniseries as well, since I've done everything chronologically. And, you know, there's things to love about that one, too, even though it's not perfect. And I think these characters are just so fun. And, you know, it was kind of how I felt when King wrote Dr. Sleep. I was like, oh, cool, we get to spend more time with this character that I like, you know, and that's how I definitely feel about the Losers Club. So even though this is long, I think it's definitely worth a watch. We definitely spoiled everything, though. So sorry. We we did. <laughs> we totally did. But you should still watch it. There's still so much we didn't talk about. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah, yeah. But Dina, thank you so, so much for joining me to talk about this one. It was a blast getting to talk to you and return to the Losers Club again. Thank you. Thank you again for, for having me. Uh, I don't know if I would have went back to rewatch this movie, but I'm glad that I did. Like it was just such a great nighttime watched when I watched it, watched it last night. So, but thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Your dedication to Stephen King. You did like, you do like a whole breakdown. Like it's just, it's wonderful. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I, I have plans for future episodes, you know, maybe we'll do that YouTube collab or something and, oh. and figure something out so we can talk about King even more. So, you know, this has been fun. And I am, you know, at this point in time that we're recording this, I'm done watching the adaptations and I'm done reading the books. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just focused on Patreon content. So I'm I'm reading the comics. So I'm not fully done with adaptations but i'm done with the main episode stuff on the main feed so now i can focus on some fun patreon stuff so you know if anyone is interested there's a link to that in the show notes there will be links to all of xena's things and you know i hope you all have been enjoying this process as much as i have because it has been a process <laughs> mm-hmm.